All right. Today is Monday, December 20th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. The market continues to sell off here. The bearishness is evident. The bears are out of hibernation right now and they are attacking the market big time. Why? Because the Fed is no longer accommodative. Number two, the fiscal support is no longer here now that we know Build Back Better is dead. The bulls, of course, have been riding the wave in this insane mania bubble for a while, and the Fed had their backs. Once it became evident that the Fed will no longer be accommodative, the bulls bailed out. And who is remaining right now with their pants down? The answer is the pigs, the greedy pigs, and the Robin Hoodites and the likes, who did not get the memo. Bulls make money. Bears make money. Pigs and Robin Hoodites get slaughtered. That is the rule, of course. We are seeing a massive exodus from this market, the likes that we have not seen in more than 20 years. And the last time we saw this kind of exodus, it was back during the implosion of the dot com bubble. On top of that, even market timers, NASDAQ market timers, these are short term traders. Their sentiment right now is bearish, although not overly bearish. What does that mean? We have more downside to go here. This is not a contrarian indicator yet. It's going to be at some point. Or we're going to have a massive relief rally. But for now, the bearishness is not too extreme to elicit that contrarian indicator. The market is falling apart underneath it all. Yes, the indices are rallying higher. The indices closer to all-time highs. But underneath it all, we're seeing implosions all over the place. The breadth remains awful. When we look at the number of stocks trading above the 200 days moving average for the Russell 2000, for example, only 36% are trading above the 200 days moving average. For the NASDAQ, even worse, 31% are trading above the 200 days moving average. Meanwhile, the Qs, the NASDAQ, remains close to all-time highs. Thank you, the big caps. Although even the big caps are about to implode too. There is no escape here, folks. The only index trading in the green when it comes to the breadth is the S&P 500. We have about 68% of the S&P 500 components trading above the 200 days moving average. Why? Because we have energy stocks, value stocks, cyclical stocks, the likes of financials, materials, industrials, defensives, all performing better than the most popular names, the mom and pop kind of names the retail crowd kind of names. And therefore, the S&P 500 is faring better than technology, high momentum, and high growth. And it's not just the market, folks. Sentiment across the country regarding the economy is souring. We have the return of the misery index that we have not seen since the 1970s. The misery index at recession-like levels, despite the experts you know, the experts who say this is the greatest economy that we've ever had. The propagandists who have no shame whatsoever. Yes, the economy is doing great, better than ever before for the 1%, the billionaires, who are soon to be trillionaires. Yet for the rest of us, average folks, regular folks, this economy is f***ing dog shit. Now, with all of that being said, see the segue from negative to positive, from bear to bull. I'm trying to be positive here, folks. With all of that being said, that doesn't mean that the market will not have relief rallies and bounces here and there. What do we have this week? We have a shortened trading week, a holiday week. We're not going to be open for trading on Friday. That's Christmas Eve. What does that mean? The volume is down and the path of least resistance during low volume weeks is higher, not lower. And therefore, I tweeted this today. The selling could dry out today. Then we'll see the oversold slash short covering rally for the rest of the week. And somebody, of course, asked me about the levels for the S&P 500. Yes, if these levels are broken, and they will be broken, by the way, we're going to have a major trouble in this market. But in the meantime, I want you to watch the VIX and how the VIX behaved today. It popped higher in the morning, but by midday, it started to melt down and close at the lows of the day. What does that mean? The VIX is saying, we will have that brief Santa ratty, the relief ratty. And if that happens, you should have watched yesterday's video because I gave you a lot of ideas. The most oversold names, the beaten down names are the ones that are going to bounce the highest, not the winners. The losers are going to bounce the highest. So watch yesterday's video and pick your pick, whatever you like. It doesn't matter to me. I presented the case for every single stock. You pick whatever you want. I picked RKK. For Tesla Witch, Kathy Wood, I bought some calls. 
with the expiration date the end of the week of course. And I also picked Robin Hood today. Once again, I picked it last week and I ate a pie in the face. Let's give it a shot one more time. And these of course folks, these are wild shot kind of trades. You're not bidding the house, you're not bidding the car, you're certainly not bidding the wife and the kids on it. These are wild shots you're bidding for oversold bounces slash short covering bounces that should be large and therefore your options will appreciate handsomely. You buy them for a day, you dump them right away. In, out, hello, goodbye. And then, after Christmas, we resume the pain. Of course, I cannot guarantee anything. I don't know how the market is going to trade day to day. All what I have to do is look at the charts and the indicators and make up trading ideas. Trust me, if I knew how the market is going to trade day to day, I wouldn't be doing this show. I would be hiding in a bunker, being busy becoming the richest man in the world. Anyhow, folks, we will look at charts options trades, and a lot more. Apologies in advance for the short intro. I'm recording this a little too late. I was busy all day. But in tomorrow's video, we will revisit the Wall of Worry. Every single item on the Wall of Worry. And here's a special one for you. We will receive a phone call from Dr. Fauci. Yep. And I guarantee you, the video will be demonetized right away. And therefore, I do not intend in monetizing tomorrow's video. I will volunteer to the big tech oligarchs and say, you know what? No more money. I don't want money tomorrow. So you know, tomorrow's show is going to be an excellent one. You don't want to miss it. But for now, we're going to move on to the market's coverage, starting with the performance of the market today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average down 433.28 points or a decline of 1.23%. The Nasdaq taking it on the chin down 188.74 points or a decline of 1.24%. The S&P 500 also down by 52.62 points or a decline of 1.14%. What about the sector's performance today? No metals whatsoever. Shame on every sector of the market. They're down. All of them down. Utilities down. Defensives down. Healthcare down, REITs down, energy down, tech down, everything is down. And the decliners were led by cyclicals, financials, and industrials. What about the advance to decline ratios? NYSE 16% advancing versus 81% declining. The NASDAQ 27% advancing versus 69% declining. Awful breadth, not a new story here. But you and I know when we see 81% of the issues declining in the NYSE, you're gonna get a bounce, at least in the future market. Whether we see a follow-up tomorrow or not, that depends on the sentiment in the morning, but my hunch is we will see a follow-up and the market will rebound tomorrow. Moving on to futures, what's going on here? We will look at energy, natural gas leading the pack here, gains of almost 4% today. On the other hand, gasoline down, heating oil down, and crude oil futures also down, both the WTI and the Brent down big today. The WTI closed with losses of almost 4%, although the losses were more severe earlier in the day the WTI was down as much as 6% today. What's going on with the oil market here? We are not worried about the supply. We know that the supply is intact, meaning OPEC has the power. And my expectations are OPEC will respond by reducing output and this will be supportive of crude oil prices. And therefore, you're seeing a lot of buy the dip in oil today. It was down 6%, closed the day at about 4% losses. So we're seeing buy the dip in oil for obvious reasons, of course. The problem with the oil market right now is the demand. Who controls the demand for oil? Certainly not OPEC. It is Jerome Powell and the Pokemon variant. The thing, Powell told us he's not going to raise interest rates until March. And that remains doubtful for now. But the other controller here for demand is the thing, the Pokemon variant. It's not really the Pokemon. It's the government's reaction. The infections are all over the place. We know that. But we have yet to see severe illnesses in the countries experiencing all of these infections. Yet the government response has been absolutely brutal. Lockdowns, restrictions, as if this thing dropping us dead all over the place. And this is what the oil market doesn't like. The hit on demand, the lockdowns, the stay-at-home environment. The good news for the oil market remains that the backlash is severe. We're seeing even the mayor-elect for New York City saying, are we going to lock down every time we have a variant? And this backlash will be contagious, not just from public officials, but small businesses, large businesses. The population is going to start to get frustrated here. And maybe, cannot guarantee it, of course, but maybe we will see a step back on the restrictions, the lockdowns, the fear porn, and oil prices will recover again. What about softs? What's going on here? OJ rising higher today, the only gainer 
in softs futures. We identified the reverse head and shoulder formation in the chart of OJ a few days ago, almost two weeks ago, and since then the gains are massive. And therefore, today I closed my OJ futures contracts. Got in at around 127. Look at where it's trading right now, almost 150. On the other hand, we have losses here led by coffee, lumber, cocoa, sugar, and cotton futures. What about metals? What's going on here? Right across the board, and the losses are led by palladium, silver, platinum, gold, and copper. Copper almost at the flat line. We had some concerning news out of Chile because we have a left wing government in Chile right now, the president-elect. And there are concerns, of course, Chile is one of the largest producers of copper. There are concerns about the output, the restrictions, the taxations, yada, yada, yada. What about meats? Red across the board, the losses led by lean hogs, feeder cattle futures, and live cattle also got hit, be it modestly. And lastly, what about grains? We have gains here in grains led by soybean meal, soybean, and wheat futures. On the other hand, we have losses led by oats. Oats down big today. We have identified the top information in oats just a few days ago. And since then, oats has been trading down. Oats futures down almost 6% today alone. What is that good for? It is good for the ticker STKL Sanapta. Popping higher today, and if oats Oats futures continue to decline. This will be good for Sun Opta and other oat milk producers. We also have losses for soybean oil down almost 2% today. On the other hand, we have flattish action for rough rice, corn, and canola futures. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? Leading the pack at number one, the hottest table by far, although the volume is down big, Apple. With about 1.2 million contracts, we had readings of 2 million, even 3 million just a few days ago. The reduction in volume for Apple is not bullish. In fact, it is an indicator that the options trading mania in Apple, the gamma squeeze, is over. And therefore, you want to avoid the big caps right now. Yes, I am aware that every expert on TV says buy the big caps, big caps are safety, yada, yada, yada. But you got to be careful here because the big caps are about to melt. If you want to catch an over sold ratty, a short covering ratty, pick the names severely overbeaten. Those are the ones that are going to bounce the most. But anyhow, Apple at number one with about 1.2 million contracts, about 69% of those were calls. At number two, NVIDIA with a little over half a million contracts, about 61% of those were calls. And at number three, AMC with almost half a million contracts, about 68% of those were calls. And here are the unusual activities that took place in the options market today, starting with the ticker KRE. This is the regional bank's ETF. They're buying calls here. What does that mean? They're betting that interest rates on the 10-year will go higher. So far, the 10-year yield hasn't been performing, even though the Fed has turned hawkish, but perhaps there is a delayed reaction here. Anyhow, they're buying calls, the 74 calls. They're also selling the 76 call. This is a spread, all for the expiration date, March 18th of next year, with expectations that the KRE will pop higher by more than 10%, but not more than 14% by then. They paid about two bucks a piece for the 74 calls and they received about one buck and a half a piece from selling the 76 calls. All in all, it cost them about 50 cents a piece, bringing the total to about $1.2 million spent on that trade. What about the ticker IWM for the Russell 2000? They're buying puts here, the 200 puts. It is just a matter of time before the IWM breaks down. This one is a little too mature in my opinion. I believe this trader will eat a pie in the face Perhaps they're dipping their toes in the trade by buying a short-term trade, see if it works or not, and then buy a longer-term trade. We'll see. But for now, they're buying the 200 puts for the expiration date, December 27, with seven days till expiration, with the expectations that the name could drop down by more than 6%. They paid about 55 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $700,000. What about the trades for the ticker ZM for Zoom? They're buying calls here. It's a spread. They're buying the 210, and they're selling the 230 calls, all for the expiration date of this upcoming Thursday, December 23rd, three days till expiration, with the expectations that Zoom will pop higher by more than 6%, but not more than 16%. They paid about one buck and 75 cents a piece for the 210 calls that they purchased, and they received about 35 cents a piece from selling the 230 calls. All in all, they spent about one buck and 30 cents a piece 
for this trade, bringing the total to about $1 million. Continuing with interesting trades, what's going on here? We start with the ticker FUTU. I'm not cursing at you, of course. This is the actual ticker for FUTU. The buying calls here, the 43 calls for the expiration date, December 31st, with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 11% by then. They paid about one buck and 30 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $1 million. And what about the ticker GKOS for Glacos? This is for glaucoma and eye disease. It's a medical device, medical innovation company. The buying puts here, the 40 bucks puts for the expiration date, January 21st with expectations that the name could drop down by more than 6% by then. And be careful if you're going to follow this one because the spread between the bed and ask is too large. In this case, the median price is around 2 bucks a piece. All in all, they spent about $1.5 million dollars for this trade. What about the ticker SQ for Square? They're buying calls big time here. The 170 calls for the expiration date March 18th with expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 7% by then. They paid about 12 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $6 million. And what about the trade for the ticker ARKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKKK
that remains to be seen. But for now, if I had to lay a bet whether the SPY is going to pop higher or flush down tomorrow, my bet will be the SPY will rebound higher, not just due to the seasonality, but also due to the technicals. And here's a daily chart for the S&P 500 futures. What's going on here? We pierced below 4,549.5, yet we closed above that number. Look at the volume. Yes, the volume is higher than average, yet it is receding and cooling down. Is this a good sign for the bulls, the ones who want to catch the rebound? Yes, it is. I'm just reading the tea leaves for you. When we look at the momentum indicators, they remain negative. Therefore, this chart is kind of a toss-up. The bears have the advantage for sure for now. But the bulls, the rebounders, could have a bounce tomorrow, assuming that the volume continues to recede and we have the typical holidays trading week. Then we will see a rebound led by the most oversold names. If we rebound higher, what happens? The target will become retesting 4,657 for what? For resistance. I doubt it that we're going to have that big of a rebound. I believe we're going to have a small one and then we resume the pain after the week. Let's say the market continues to sell off. What are we looking at? We're looking at 4,549 and a half. That is target number one. If that fails, then we're going down to revisit 4,472. Here is a chart for the Qs, the Nasdaq, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? A gap down in the morning, catching the support of 379 and then closing at the highs of the day. Again, the overall theme is bearish, but the closing is bullish. Closed at the highs of the day and it appears, at least from the behavioral element of the chart today, that the selling is drying out at least for this week. We'll see what happens here. But the obvious destination here for a rebound would be closing the gap. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract of the NASDAQ? What's going on here? The momentum indicators remain negative. We have negative divergence from both the MACD and the RSI. On top of that, we have already lost the support of 15,976. 15,975, it doesn't matter to me. It is within that number, within that range. We lost that support. All of these are points for the bears. What are the points for the bulls? Number one, we rebounded higher, at least for today, from the support zone. Number two, look at the volume. Yes, higher than average, but it is cooling down from the last trading days. You weigh it all together, the bulls versus the bears. The bears have a few points, the momentum indicator, the loss of support, the head and shoulder formation versus the bulls who have the volume in their side cooling off and the little mini rebound that we saw today by the end of the day. Who has the advantage? In the longer run, the bears have the advantage for now. Does that mean that the bulls cannot rebound for a few days till Christmas? Come on, man. We can be better than that. The bears are more uh, merciful. They'll give you a little bit of rebounds here and there to make sure that you're fat enough and then they feast on you anyways. Moving on to the IWM, the Russell 2000, 30 minutes chart, what's going on here? The Russell gapping down, not quite to 208, but rebounded higher from around 210. That is yet another support that we did not identify in this chart because otherwise it's going to be lines all over the place. The chart rebounded higher and revisited 213 to retest that level as resistance. So far, it failed to recapture that level as support once again. Is it a done deal? Is it over for the Russell 2000? Of course not. We still have a few more days to go here. You cannot make decisions based on one candle. For all you know, the Russell 2000 went down to gather some energy before it pops higher to regain 213 as support and perhaps close the gap. The problem with the Russell here, when we look at the weekly chart for the RUT, the big Russell 2000, the line in the sand is 2100. We're getting close enough here. If the RUT closes below 2100, then cue the Elmo with the fire thing. Next, we have the Dixie, the dollar index. What's going on here? Tricky Dixie is not making it easier for any of us. It goes up, it goes down. It is still trading within range. 96 for support and 97 for resistance. And therefore, we cannot make a call here one way or the other until and unless one of these two is broken. Either you're going to break above 97 and we will trade accordingly. Of course, if you're long commodities, you want the dollar to break down. And therefore, gold is not sure for now what to do. It started to rally higher. Then it looked back and said, you know what? What's going on with the Dixie here? Did I rally prematurely? And my answer is to gold, no, you did not. You got to be confident here. It doesn't matter what the Dixie is going to do. Yes, it is the number one enemy for gold, and it will continue to dictate the move for gold. But here's the thing. We are seeing some sobering up for market participants when it comes to this market mania and this market bubble. As if we're finally realizing that all good stories will come to an end. 
and good stories involving mania and cocaine will end up in death. And this is exactly what's going to happen to this market bubble because the Fed is no longer accommodative. On top of that, we have the Pokemon. And on top of that, we have the fiscal policy not being supportive anymore. So are we going to see the rush to true safety? Finally, what is true safety? It is gold. Not Bitcoin, not tulips, not garbage, not GME, GameStop, not AMC, not horse manure, not NFTs. The real safety is gold. Are we going to see that sobering moment? If we do, this will be positive for gold. For now, we're going to continue to watch the two enemies, the dollar and the 10-year yield. The dollar is not sure where to go, but the second enemy for gold, the 10-year yield, popped higher today. And here is the chart the 10-year yield and of course that perhaps explains the pullback in gold the 10-year yield caught support from 1.375 basis points and rallied higher so far when the 10-year has been rallying this has been good for the stock market overall so that was yet another leading indicator for me that we will see a bounce higher in the market starting tomorrow yes there is a limit if the 10-year gets too high not on pfizer's weed but meaning above 1.6 1.7 percent then the Nasdaq will start to shed its pants again. The sweet spot is for the 10-year to consolidate. No major moves, up or down. This is the sweet spot for growth, momentum, aka the Nasdaq. What has been rattling the market as of late is the flattening of the yield curve, meaning the 30, the 20, the 10 moving down while the 2-year moving higher. A flattening yield curve is a precursor for an inverse yield curve, which always, always an indicator of an upcoming recession. And this is what the stock market did not like, that perhaps the Fed is too hawkish and will make a policy mistake producing a recession. My rebuttal, of course, is perhaps a recession is the remedy needed to battle this inflation. Therefore, when we see the 10-year, the 30-year yield moving higher, that cools off that negative sentiment in the overall market. So you got to keep that in mind. And here's a chart for the TLT, a weekly chart. What's going on here? We're looking at 149, still trading above 149, and therefore the debate continues we have no idea where the bond market is going to go but for now the pop that we saw in the 10 year today is perhaps a leading indicator that we will see a pop in the overall market at least till christmas the so-called pathetic santa rally could happen and notice once again the market has been trading down as of late when the tlt has been rallying so if the tlt cools down the assumption is the market will pop in a bounce at least all the way till Christmas. And here it is, the most important chart for the day, the VIX 4 hours chart. We are still trading, when we look at the MACD, still trading in positive territory, creating green impressions on the histogram. But it is curling down. It popped higher, closed the gap, at 27.16 and then started to melt down all the way till the end of the day. Remove the tag of the VIX and let's assume that this is a chart for a stock, whatever stock it is. Is this behavior bullish or bearish? The answer is overall it is bullish because we're popping higher. But the closing is not bullish. The closing is bearish, indicating that perhaps the VIX will go down to close the gap at 21.58. And then we'll take it from there. Let's say that the VIX closes the gap at around 21.58 and then it rebounds higher then here is your indicator that the spy the rebound in the spy perhaps was transitory and only lived overnight if we close the gap at 21.58 and then the vix continues to melt down then you know that the rebound in the spy will continue to go on and here is a chart for apple the ticker aapl this is a daily chart of course when we look at the macd indicator the rsi both negative we're seeing a red impression in the histogram. The daily is not bullish for Apple. And therefore, I say if you want to bet on a rebound rally, you pick the losers, the overbeaten names. These are the ones that are going to bounce the highest. Not Apple, not Microsoft, not Google, not the big caps. We are still eyeing closing the gap at around 165.32. And here it is, a chart for Tesla, the souffle daily chart. What's going on here? We are getting closer to an oversold territory. What does that mean? An upcoming bounce for Tesla. My preference is for the chart to go down to the trend line and then it rebounds higher from that point on. It would be a more solid ground to start a rebound from. Yet, we had a target. Target number one. One, closing the gap at around 900 and we said that the chart could bounce higher from that point on target number one if that fails then we go to target number two you saw what was going on in the options market today they're betting millions of dollars that tesla will rebound higher by the end of the week i'm not gonna fight them 
My assumption is, yes, Tesla could rebound higher in a relief rally all the way to the end of the week, and then we're going to look for a reversal and catch it from that point on on the downside again. Moving on to Tulips, what's going on here? BTC. I'm starting to like it here. We're seeing the formation of the saucer bottom. It's a process. The momentum indicators are strengthening, of course. I'm starting to like it. What does that mean? Perhaps it is a contrarian indicator that you should get the f out if you are a tulip enthusiast. But all joking aside, the chart for now is forming a saucer bottoming formation. The momentum indicators are strengthening. These are all bullish formations. Until and unless there is a break in these formations, the assumption for now, we will see a pop higher in BTC. Lastly, moving on to AMC Apes. What's going on here? They're still moving higher, although it was a battle in the morning. The CEO came out in the morning pumping. And by the way, when a CEO dumps on my head, I'm out. Yet the apes have no dignity whatsoever. They're actually making excuses for the guy. Oh, he has to sell. He has to pay some bills, right? Like the Tesla culties will say, oh, Elon has to dump. He has to pay some taxes. The stock is not going to get hurt, honey baby. When the CEO starts to dump, it is not a good sign. But for now... The apes are fighting back, they're buying a lot of call options, and this is forcing the market maker to buy shares of AMC, thus pushing it higher. But to move the stock higher legitimately, you gotta do both. Somebody gotta buy the stock. The lazy way is to buy call options aggressively and have the market maker assume that risk by buying the shares. But the apes are interesting in massive gains. They wanna be big shots. You wanna be a big shot, you gotta do both. You gotta buy call options like crazy, and you gotta buy the underlying stock too. We're not talking about three apes buying, we're talking about millions. Do you have that momentum or not? If you wanna elicit a short squeeze, you gotta do both aggressively. Of course, the smart apes are gonna look at this and say, you know what, let them do whatever they wanna do. I have a target, perhaps it is 35, 32, 38, even 40. Once the stock hits that number, I'm out. I will book profits, book losses, whatever it is, and get out. Because this thing will go down to zero. You and I know it. And Spider-Man is not gonna save your ass. And here's a fun piece about the sentiment among apes and the meme traders. It says Spider-Man yanks AMC stock 19% higher, while a poop emoji tweet has little effect on GameStop. Of course, the dumper tweeted staggering Spidey numbers, 1.1 million, 7 million, who cares? I thought you guys are not into fundamentals, remember? And of course, while the CEO was rejoicing, he dumped about $9 million now, he got the money, he got the cash, the sentiment among apes was not that positive at all. On Reddit, the vibe was different. Apes, something is happening, quote unquote, was the title of one popular Friday morning post on subreddit, whatever that is, Dow down almost 600. We are rocketing, quote unquote. I call it the Spidey effect, aka the Peter Tingle, responded a fellow ape. Still, other apes were not yet appeased. This is not Mo ass. This is a chimp language, of course. It means the mother of all spreadsheets. Cautioned one user. This is a teeny weeny spike. Yawn. Don't get excited until it rises 10,000% minimum, quote unquote. But that might be tough, at least in the short term. And here is your holy short squeeze. And there is also a tough case to make that AMC is currently squeezable. According to Ortex, short interest on AMC was flat on Friday. What does that mean? The pop that you saw on Friday was not short covering. It was a lot of buying of call options. Holding steady, this is the short interest, of course, at just over 20% of the entire float. Interestingly, Fidelity's buy to sell ratio was essentially flat on the day, giving the sense that some paper handed apes might have cashed in da -da -da -da, with an eye on the variant. And we are not unaware that roughly 30% of the many open options trades on AMC and options are a huge part of AMC expired at Friday's closing bell, meaning it was a short pump in, out, hello, goodbye. Now, what about the game stoppers? Well, their cult leader tweeted a poop emoji and that failed to pop the stock higher. The poop-based investors did not show up here in GME. You know, the ones who pop stocks higher, they stampede heads first, Naruto style, buy first, ask questions later, based on a poop emoji or an eggplant emoji by Elon Musk. You know, the smart bunch. But anyhow, out of the zoo and into the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar this week? Nothing important tomorrow, but Wednesday we have the Consumer Confidence Index and then we have existing home sales. 
Thursday, December 23rd, will be the most busy day here before the holiday. We will have the initial jobless claims, personal income, consumer spending, core inflation, disposable income, PCE inflation, this will be important, durable goods, new home sales, and the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. Folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening, thank you for watching, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow. Oh, 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 oh,